Hello, and welcome to another edition of Addiction Talk. My guest tonight, another powerful story. And I think as I've been doing and learning more about him, what was so interesting to me is that he thought this could never happen to him. But as we know, addiction does not discriminate. Listen to Josh Eppert's story. Josh Eppert, drummer for the rock band Coheed in Cambria, has been a seasoned musician for more than two decades. But in the early 2000s, Josh was about to lose it all. While his band was receiving international acclaim, Josh was secretly battling a drug addiction and ultimately left the band. He went from successful young rock star to homeless, sleeping on couches and doing anything to secure his next fix. After getting treatment and many failed relapses, Josh now has almost 15 years in recovery. He was able to return to Coheed and Cambria five years after leaving and is once again playing for audiences all over the globe. Addiction Talk starts now. And we are excited tonight to talk to Josh because, first of all, Josh, I know you're going to drop so many golden nuggets and <laughs> we're preparing for this talk and you and I were in the green room. I know you said there's some parts of your story that you want to make sure that you share and just to give a candid look at what you really went through. So first of all, thank you for joining us tonight and being willing to share your story with us. No, oh, thanks for having me. I, you know, I, th to me, this is a really big deal to be on Addiction Talk. And uh, yeah, I can't thank you enough for having me on, Joy. I really appreciate it. And you already have an audience behind you, I see. Well, yeah, these are my <laughs> friends here. I'm in my movie room. You know what, Rob, my partner Rob said, why don't you go in the movie room? It'll look great. And as we're doing this, I'm like, oh, we're going to be talking about like serious stuff. And I've got two G. But you know what? This is me. <laughs> and not to try to segue into when I was an addict, not to jump right in. I didn't enjoy this stuff. Everything in my life that I enjoyed had been completely wholesale removed from my life. Uh, I didn't enjoy movies. I didn't enjoy baseball. I'm a diehard Mets fan. I have a Mets tattoo on my chest. But in, in when I was in full addiction, I didn't even know if the Mets were playing or if they were in the playoffs. It just muted. So I do kind of feel at 43 years old, 14 or 15 years removed from my heroin addiction that I have like an over the top love of the things that I love. And I just feel so lucky to love them. I, I get giddy when I watch a movie and I can't wait for it to start because it feels, I remember what it felt like to not love anything anymore. So not to try to make, give it a deep spin, but that's why my guys are with me and I'm a little nervous, man. You know, I had to have my guys with me. It's my crew. Well, I'm a little nervous with them in the background, but I think we're all good. <laughs> no, they're lovers. You know, they're misunderstood. These guys are lovers. Mwah. I love my Jasons. These are my guys right here. You know, something that was really interesting, Josh, because you are 15, nearly 15 years out from the height of your addiction. You talked about heroin. Is it still very vivid in your memory? Is it still something that plays in your mind of how far you've come or what that moment was like in your, in that time in your life? Got good question, Joy. You know, yes and no, because uh, any junkie will tell you in the early going or when you're trying to clean up or kind of doing the dance back and forth, you have these drug dreams and man, are they powerful? They could throw off your whole day or even multiple days. They're just these visceral, powerful dreams. Mm -hmm. Those fade over time. Uh, in fact, you know, it kind of served as a real barometer for getting better when I had a kind of uh, seemingly ominous dream on tour one night. I was, I was already trying to restart my career. So I'm within the first kind of two years away from heroin. And I had this dream where I wasn't a junkie in the dream. And I realized mm -hmm. that's the first dream in as long as I can remember that I wasn't an addict. So that stuff fades, which... Uh, you know, thank God that it fades. But there are always reminders. There are always things. And I think it's healthy. I think I have enough distance that I can look back and kind of, I don't know, digest and absorb some of the really dark things, some of the really dark places that I went mentally, some of the dark places I went physically in terms of surgeries. I mean, I don't, I don't want to say I almost lost my arm, but too close for me. 
had a giant yeah. abscess on my arm. I was in the hospital for four days in Virginia. Don't be reminders of this stuff, but God, you know, dare I say it's in a healthy way. But I think that distance gives you enough time in between to look back and absorb. But of course there's reminders. This is a big piece of my life. And um, I mean, that's why I'm on addiction talk. Mm -hmm. I'm not running from it. I don't want to bury my head and hide from it. I think there's honor in owning the bed that you've made and mm -hmm. making the bed better and making your life better. I think, I think that's an honorable thing. And, um, but yeah, I hope that answers the question. It's like, no, a that was thing, you know? because I wonder, you know, when we look out, like you said, you're close to 15 years in sobriety and, and people wonder, does it get easier? Does it get better? Do you still, and you talked about having the dreams and then one day, you realize that you are not struggling with addiction in a dream like yeah. that. That is huge. And I think that message to other people of just that this does get better. You know, this can be you, there is hope, you know, and is that something when you think about how far you come, you've come. Is hope something that you hope people get from your story? Oh, absolutely. I mean, point blank wholesale across the board. Does it get easier? Yes. Hear the words. It get, I mean, I feel like early on in me leaving heroin in the past, I was blind, deaf. I, you know what? I really, I hate to remove any of the credit for myself, but at the first year was kind of merely to get people off my back. I had burned every bridge and eventually, mm. you know, I was probably a really kind of ego driven young guy, but maybe not really inside. I said, man, maybe there's something when everyone's telling me something, maybe there's some truth to it. So I didn't see a light at the end of the tunnel. My life was mm. all darkness, but eventually a little light. And you know, mm. people, they were right, you know, eventually, but I didn't even see the light at first. When I stumbled into recovery, there was no light. It was really, and I kind of, or maybe I wrote it off as whatever, I'll get these people off my back. But I had fully planned on using drugs again in that first year, possibly even two years mm. of away from heroin. I had planned on using drugs again. This was just some time. And I kid you not, Joy, that dream didn't even hit me right away. It was, I woke up, mm. oh, what a weird dream. I had a dream that a good friend of mine was using and I was trying to stop him in the dream. And it, it actually took mm. a little bit to, for it to land. Holy cow. I was, I didn't probably, I probably didn't say holy cow, but I'll throw this podcast. <laughs> holy cow. I wasn't using in the dream. I wasn't a junkie mm -hmm. in the dream. And it, and I'm, I give myself a little bit of credit for at least recognizing that. And it became like this pillar of sorts. And then, a, you know, a year had become two years. And then I start imagining, I mean, I think after a year, that was also another moment. Holy crap. It's been a real year. Not a year to some people, but I actually used six months ago, once or twice, and nobody knows. A real year. And then I said, mm -hmm. maybe there's something to this. And then the little bit of light. And then, a, you know, for me, some good things start happening when you leave drugs behind. But God damn it, you don't see it at first, man. You mm -hmm. do not see it. Blind, deaf, just fine. I'll go over here. Leave me alone. I am out of money. I'm out of friends. I'm out of everything. Fine, I'll go over here. You know, I was arrogant. I mm. thought everybody was wrong, but a little piece of me said, ah, just to shut them up, I'll go over here. And it saved my fucking life. Oh, sorry, sorry. No more cursing. Uh, it saved my life. It saved mm. my life listening to the people around me. But I can't stress this enough. No, at first, after, you know, it takes a long time to escape right. this thing that you have invited in. This like that blanket. darkness that you said. Yeah. And, you know, I want to go back to the height of your addiction, because here you were, you know, many people saw you in the light, limelight. Your band is at the height of international acclaim. Everything seems to be going good, but you're struggling. And you had to make a decision, or was it your decision? I don't 100% know this, to walk away from it all. No, I want to be clear. I, I walked away because I was surely about to be fired. And I just want to make it clear. I had been given, I cannot stress this enough, so many chances. These guys were putting up with us falling asleep at our instruments, us not showing up, us just absolute messes. And, you know, I know now, because those guys are my brothers, they were having meetings like, 
what do we do? These guys are going to die. Like wow. they tried to help. They tried to help and gave us, you know, these are also young men. It's not like I was 22 and they were 45. We were all kids, you know, so they didn't know what the hell to do. And, and, uh, you thought I, it, it was obviously it was selfish and awful, but I quit. You want to know the real story, Joy? Yeah, I, I do. Yeah. I, I quit Coheed and Cambria because I was so high. We had had, they put me into a rehab. I made it about, I don't know, by day two, I had to get out of there. I was starting to get sick. Instead of just admitting that I have a problem, I was trapped in a cycle of lies. And my father drove me to this rehab and I was using dope in the bathroom at the diner that we stopped at before we went into the rehab. And I could, here I am, I'm in a rehab. These are the people you tell, I've been lying. I need to get right, but no. I haven't used in two weeks. I'm fine. Two weeks is the sign of somebody who's lying because two weeks Mm. wouldn't get it done. But that was what I was saying. That was my story. I was sticking to it. I leave the rehab and the band has a meeting for me. Mm. It was Tuesday at 11. I'm so high. I wake up and look at my phone and it says Tuesday, 5 a.m. And I thought I missed the meeting because, Mm. listen, I might not be the sharpest guy. I know how to tell time, but I was so high so removed from reality i thought i missed the meeting and i sent them an email almost trying to be righteous well i guess you guys know i'm not coming now i just couldn't come you know Mm -hmm. i've had enough of this crap you guys are accusing me of being an addict only in the mind of a junkie am i Mm -hmm. mad at them for accusing me of being an addict well i'm so high i can't tell time Mm -hmm. i think that really kind of paints the picture of like where an addict's mind can go um, but that's actually how I left the band, but it was all, I knew if I went to that meeting, I was getting told you're out of here and, and rightfully so. I mean, I, hundreds of chances for years and I just wrecked, I spit in their face every day and that's not, you know, it's something I'm deeply ashamed of and I'm so thankful I got, it's not a second chance. It's more about, a, it's like a 400 and second chance, but I got, you know, I came back to my band, um, against some of their better judgment, man. I mean, Claudio and Travis want to be back. The manager, Blaze, was like, dude, I have my concerns. And he should have. And I think, you know, it's been almost 12 years back in the band. I, I think I've uh, I think I've think quenched those concerns <laughs> that he had. But And thank God, thank God, what a lucky SOB mm. I am that I got a chance to come back and make it right. But, yeah, I quit before I was getting fired is the mm-hmm. uh, Cliff Notes version of that long story. But And when you quit quit and you're in that moment josh do you think my career's over do you think what next like what was going through your mind or did you think they don't know what they're talking about i know you said there was just denial i'm gonna go and do something else what was going through your mind when you actually knew that that was over some dream that you had you made it big and now you're like i'm leaving this like that i can't even imagine that feeling but i want to know what you were feeling in that uh yeah probably inside you know the actual me was probably terrified but the all that would come out the mind of a or the mouth of a not terribly evolved guy at the time if i do say so myself was you know f those guys i'll get in another band and it almost was true i got hired by the band gym class heroes a few weeks out of coheed and uh, gym class was w- even more successful than Coheed. And I was going to be the percussion player. So I was friends with all those guys and we we're going to tour around. And uh, eventually the management was like, we are not. I had tar- my, trashed my reputation. Mm. Uh, no one would hire me. But, uh, mm. you know, that was really unfortunate because I kind of, you know, I have this feeling that maybe both me and Travi McCoy the main guy from gym class heroes would both be dead. If I, if I did, if Travi pushed to see that through, but uh, yeah, some kind of like false bravado, oh, I'll find another job. Oh, I'll get whatever. I don't need those guys. F those guys. When really those guys just wanted to help me. And I had pushed them to the point of where they had to let me go. I mean, obviously they wanted me. I mean, if they wanted to fire me, I gave them a reason every day. I give them a reason every single day to fire me. Uh, and they did not for like multiple years. So yeah, you asked a really great question. What was what was really going on in my quiet moments at night? I was terrified. Mm. And I knew that I had just let down everybody, but I just wasn't able to access that in any sort of 
realistic way. So like I did when I was afraid, I met it with the most kind of corny, cliched bravado you could imagine. Mm -hmm. Like I said, F those guys. Those guys don't know, whatever. I'll get in another band. When, when I knew better at the time, but I certainly know now, opportunities like that just don't come around. Mm -hmm. uh, for most people, never. I sit in this, uh, this position of such privilege, such luck. I'm so blessed. And then not even just my career wise, the fact that I'm breathing today. I mean, I, yeah. I do have a, you know, bona fide survivor skill. I, uh, and why do you say you have survivor skill? Well, I've just lost so many friends. Um, and I, you know, it might wrong or right. I, I just, there was a time, I don't mean to say I'm crass or, but there was a time, this is what it's about. I had a lot of money. It went, all went in my arm. And yet I have friends that died from shooting two bags when I'm shooting 10 bags, 10 times a day. Mm -hmm. How the hell am I here? And yeah, yeah I, I don't want to say I struggle with that. I think that I've been, I think I did struggle with that for a long time, but I, I, I'd i like to think that I've been forthcoming and have made peace with it, but I've lost a lot of people and it does bother me still. I've, mm -hmm. I've lost people that, uh, I don't mean, uh, you know, what I don't mean to get emotional. It's hard to talk about, man. Uh, there's people that are gone that I've sh that I showed how to shoot up. You know, there's people, mm. and yeah, I don't think it's that much of a, of a leap to to say, hey, you struggle with that? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, of course. But I try to take, I try to accept what I've done, and I try to make the world a better, brighter place while I'm in it. And I'm trying. I am always trying. My natural kind of default position. I'm flawed, believe me. There are people out there that know I'm deeply flawed, but like I am kind. I'm a mm -hmm. soft guy. And uh, yeah, I have regrets. I mean, I think about the people in, and not even that necessarily died. I think about every person. I think about the person that showed me how to shoot up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these are deep, deep regrets of mine. Um, but yeah, I can't change it. So all I can do at this juncture is just try to, live the best life I can. I do want to help people. I, I think saying I, I want to share my story because it can help people. And that is odd to me. I'm actually a little uncomfortable with attention. Mm. But after you we can be uncomfortable with attention, you're on you're you know, you tour around the world. That's really interesting for me to hear. Yeah, I'm the drummer, Joy. I will literally walk by a crowd of a thousand fans of my band and maybe two of them even know who I am. I have this perfect middle ground where like the real diehards know me, and then I can actually build relationships with them. But the casual fan, they don't know who the drummer is. Especially we in the seventies, you knew who the drummer was. We are in the two two thousand twenty three. They don't care who the drummer is unless you're like one of a handful of eerily good drummers, which uh, I don't think I'm one of them. So, and I get more love than most drummers. But yeah, that's I kind of see this perfect middle ground where like. The band gets a lot of attention, but I'm able to kind of just exist and do my thing. And I like it like that. But I do get a little uncomfortable with attention and I get uncomfortable with the, my story. But I really felt a call to action. I don't know what death it was, but just another death. And I mm. said, man, I, again, it sounds super cliche. It sounds super corny, but God damn it. It's true that if, if you can help one person, I hope that I can help more than one person. But if you do help one, then it's worth it. And I just, maybe as part of the guilt of mm -hmm. these people that aren't here and knowing that I showed friends how to, how to take this drug the most hardcore way. I showed them how, and that's how they lost their life. Maybe that is part of what drives me to do drum set confessional. By the way, that's what a thing that we're doing, drumsetconfessional.com, YouTube drum set confessional, where, uh, addicts or anyone whose life has been touched by drugs or addiction in any way, they can come and share their stories anonymously. Mm -hmm. uh, I bounce back. We talk about things. And this is like, it's like a new band. This is in the infant stages. Uh, me and my partner, Rob Arnoff. But it's like building. getting real. Getting yeah. real. Because, you is, know, yeah. the thing about it is, I wonder for you, I know you said, you know, you don't like the crowds or the attention. What is the hardest part about sharing your story? What makes uh, it so difficult? What part makes it difficult for you? Well, I, you know, I don't really have that hard of a time talking about it. I have a hard time when I start crying. I'm just like, it's like leftover ancient relics of like 
boys don't cry, which is ridiculous. And I don't subscribe to that notion, but instantly I'm like on the playground in fifth grade and I'm just not mm. supposed to cry. Joy, you should have seen me at my first college like speaking event. I walk out on stage, mm. first thing, crying. And I'm saying to myself, crying's never cool in the beginning, bro. What are you doing? I just was so moved that, is this me? Am I actually up here talking? Like, and I look out in the crowd and I, I'm going to cry talking about it right now. I see the assistant manager who was around for a lot of the darkest stuff. It was around for me leaving the band, was around for my life spiraling. And she had flown in to come see me speak at this college. And I was just so moved, beyond moved, that before I even utter a word on the stage, I'm literally bawling. And I don't mean a tear or two, I mean bawling. Um, mm. That is the hardest part is trying not to cry. I know it sounds that's a silly answer, but that is because I there's some there's like a deep cathartic release from connecting with other. I have this thing I say on drumsetconfessional.com when I'm uh, replying to the stories and getting into conversation is we are each other's people. Whether mm. you're a month clean, whether you're not clean, whether you're in the battle, you are my people and I am your people. I understand. We understand. I want to talk to you. I don't want to shun you and I don't want to cut you out. So I enjoy talking about it. I just, I went, I got to work on getting emotional, but I think this is all you talked it's about. Of that journey because yeah. you know, the thing that I, that you said that was so powerful to me, you said, this is me. So when people see how far you've come, help us to understand how far you come, you've come in terms of, what your rock bottom looked like. I know we knew the struggles with the band and things like that, but what was it like living in the state that you were living? I know you talked about it as darkness, but what was that like to be able to say, oh my God, this is me now, because I remember what it was. Uh, yeah, another great question. I mean, at the darkest point, I mean, I have no place to live. I'm, I'm, but, and it is worth mentioning. I come from a small town, Kingston, New York, and uh, I've never been particularly cool. And when the band took off, it made you feel really good about yourself. People noticed. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're on MTV. We're, I'm from a small town. Everyone noticed, and every, it's backpacks and or, or patting on the back and. Way to go. Guys that picked on me in high school are coming up and giving me big hugs and we're so proud of you. And I felt good. And then at, out of the band, uh, deeply entrenched in heroin addiction, out of money, out of everything, it became the polar opposite. Anyone who saw me, mm. I went, I kind of like I went from there's Josh Shepard, hometown boy made good to there's Josh Shepard, that scumbag. He had it all and blew it. And they were right. I did blow mm -hmm. it. And uh, just, you know, having, and life isn't about material things, but I had nothing. I mean, I had blown, I had it and blew it. And you know how many musicians, you know how many musicians, talented, ultra talented musicians I know that never got their shot. Mm -hmm. And then I had to face these people. I got a shot mm -hmm. and I spit right in its face. And these people had no respect for me and I could feel it. I could feel it. And it was, painful but you know more tangible ways i i was out of money i had sold everything i could sell uh drum sets memorabilia things that are should be priceless to me mm. were just gone in an instant i was back on my parents floor living on my parents living room floor in our 800 square foot apartment that i was raised in and i could feel you know what the worst part is i could feel everyone's disappointment mm. i had there was no light there was no light and and every, every time I shot up, that was going to be the last time. Every time. But yet this went on for years. Every time I'm going to fix up right now, and then I'm going to make this right. I just fucked over this guy, and we just robbed this guy. We just were stealing over here, but I'm going to make this right. I just got to mm -hmm. fix up and get not sick. And then all of a sudden, years went by like this. And I didn't make mm -hmm. anything right. I just dug deeper and deeper and deeper. And... uh I mean, it's nothing short of a miracle that I sit here today without heroin mm. in my life. I, I don't even know how it happened. I think, you know, I'm such a believer in the program, obviously, but I did. I The program would have worked if I worked it. I didn't. I was too selfish and too lost 
mm. to even have the good sense to let the pro to let the people trying to help me. Like I said before, Joy, I'm at a rehab, still locked in a cycle of lying. Mm. I got mad at the people at the rehab for suggesting that I was even kicking as I started to get sick. And then it's a phone call to my friends. They're driving three hours, picking me up. We're out of here. I'm shooting up that night. And I just. How many times would you say, Josh, that it took before you finally made the decision? Because I also want to say two, one thing. One, addiction is a disease. And so I know there's a part of it that we there's still that stigma there that people, you know, how people were judging you. Yes, there were choices that you had, but still understanding it was a disease. But I also wanted to go back to how many times did it take to you finally got it? And what was different? Was it, I know you mentioned the dream. Was it that dream that finally said, I'm going to take this seriously. I'm going to work the program. I'm going to turn my life around. What would, what would you say was that pivotal moment? moment well, for you? The dream was a pillar, but the dream came after we'll call it a year, but it could have been a year and a couple months. It could have been a year and a half, but that's when that dream happened. She's actually, there were plenty of drug dreams after that dream, but that dream served as a pillar. But before that, God, Joy, and I want you to know, I wish I had this like really well, beautiful answer about this moment of clarity or this epiphany that I had. But no, uh, I had to come clean to my girlfriend at the time, now my wife, that I'm a heroin addict. She had no idea. And that mm. there were people at my house waiting to kill me or hurt me. And these were serious guys. These were guys that would do it. Uh, we can't go home. So we have to spend the night in the basement of a friend's house because we can't go home because, and she said, I'm moving you to Albany. And she dragged me. So Albany, New York is about an hour from my hometown. Well, when you're a junkie with no car, no, forget no car, no license, no car, no money, nothing. I have nothing. Might as well have been Europe. It might as well have been Los Angeles. I, she dragged me to Albany kicking and screaming. And that was really the catalyst for me to just get a little bit of space and for me to at least entertain the idea of no more drugs. But like I said, this was only to get people off my back, which is awful. I wish that wasn't the story, but I think I made a promise to be not just to you, but to myself to be real. And that is the reality. My first when did it become about you? Curious. When did it become about you? I know you said uh, it was, you know, for a while it's about the other people, but was there a point where it became about you? Do you remember that? Absolutely. Yeah. I think I mean it's 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 hard kind of like siphoning a uh, kind of a broad period of time into one thing. The dream played a role. Getting back in a band played a role. And it wasn't terribly long. I just had no light. I couldn't see a light. I went and stumbled in dark. I trusted people that I said, man, maybe I don't know everything. And maybe everyone telling me something should matter. I'm going in. I went in. And I mean, it didn't take long to start seeing a little speckle of light. But I just I know complete and total darkness. And I lived in it. I sound like Bane from the Batman movies. But I did. I did. I knew utter darkness with no more light. And then a phone call from a friend wanting to start a band. And then. Uh, you know, I just, I made drugs not a part of my life anymore. And that's where the light came from. But it, it came about me around the time that I started playing music again, uh, which Ooh. I know sounds fairly serendipitous, but that's really, you're asking really good questions, Joy. Uh, <laughs> it's a really terrific question. And sometimes my, these aren't like homogenized answers. These are real answers from a real person. I don't mean to like self-contradict and I recognize that there are people that just like I need help still to this day might need help. I don't mean that in any kind of like a talking down way, but people that are in need of help. And I just, this is one story. This isn't the way it always is. This is just one story and it's my story. But yeah, if I'm being honest at first, there was no light. I saw no light. I just had to trust and let people shove me this way until I saw a speckle. And then, yeah, you're goddamn right. I ran towards that speckle. And that speckle was uh, a band called Terrible Things. Um, a guy named MC Lars, a guy named Ernie, who was a good friend of mine back in the day, he told me that, you know, like we could make music together and that he believed in me. Uh, you take away one of those things, I have a feeling my life is much different. So it's like this chorus of things. Mm -hmm. It's a plethora of things. So it's hard to... 
Yeah. And nail it down. But you know what I hear in the story is even though it was music, it was like hope. Yeah. There is, you know what I mean? Like there's yes. like this hope, like I can have some semblance of my life back. I There is life again, you know? Yeah. And you have to understand it. I'm not getting called to join a band where we're on tour buses and private planes. We are in a van, 10 guys to the van, staying at Roach motels. But it really, it gifted me a sense of self, kind of re-engaged me in music because I'd given up on music. I think I joined Terrible Things and actually hadn't played drums in like a year. I just, I was, drums, I don't own a drum set. I sold everything. I don't own anything anymore. I don't own a drum. I don't have a pair of drum sticks. In fact, Fred used to have to just like Western Union me money uh, with the question because I didn't even like have an ID or he just uh, Fred was a guy from the band, also a famous musician. He was in a band called Taking Back Sunday, who had reached commercial heights even greater than Coheed. And he was starting a band and he tapped me. He asked me to be in it. And it was it changed my life. And Fred knows that I've told Fred that. He's probably sick of hearing it at this point, but I've told him enough times how that really altered. But hey, something went my way. And no matter what's going on in life, it can't get darker than mine. And finally, one little thing went my way. And it wasn't all the bells and whistles. This was just an idea that a guy had that he involved me in. I took a bus, a Greyhound bus, out to Westchester. And we jammed. And uh, yeah, it really changed everything for me. But with music was hope. That was hope. And a semblance, not of fame and fortune, but... Of just your passion. You've been doing this since you were a kid. I've been doing this forever, dude. So, but God, it really just really reminds me right now of how much music is in my blood. It is a, sometimes when you do this every day, you get like sour on it. But God, a mm -hmm. conversation like this just really reminds me of, it's impossible for me to not play music. And music mm -hmm. was the gift for me. Music really, you know, again, a chorus of things. My wife a suboxone doctor that didn't kick me off after I peed dirty a few times. I don't want to get him in trouble, but uh, moving to Albany and terrible things. But I think anyone that gets better, it's got to be a chorus of things. And you asked me how many times did it take to get right? I had tried to get clean at hundreds of times. Mm. I wanted to get clean every day. Like I told you, every time I shot up, this was going to be the last time. Mm -hmm. I'm going to fix you know up. There's something, Josh, that I want to bring about your journey because you said there was a part of your recovery that you kept hidden. You didn't want to talk about for a while. Yeah, Let's talk my, about it because, yeah. you know, there is this stigma even within the recovery community that if you're not completely sober and not off any substance of substances, are you really in recovery? And you chose a different route that you said had been instrumental for you. Tell me about why you went that route and how you had to fight against the perceptions of other people to be able to get to the recovery you have today. Yeah. Well, I mean, I went that route because I kept failing. I, I desperately wanted to get clean, but when you're so addicted, when it's, if every day feels like life or death, being sick, like dope sick gets you feels a sick, I feel like is the wrong word, but it's the best word we got, but it's, it's something more than sick. It's something so awful and just so deep. And I had done, believe me, I have gotten, I've gotten through withdrawal a few times. It gets worse and it gets worse and it gets worse. And I just, by the way, I had failed off the Suboxone program like 10 times, six times, something, a lot of times. And then I, there was a doctor, Dr. Ravi Ramaswamy in Saugerties, New York, who told me, he said, if you pee dirty again, it's out of my hands but you're worth it. Can't you be smart for 30 seconds a day? And I was kind of pissed. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, he objective, you know, his mission accomplished, Dr. Ramaswamy. He laughs about it now because we're like long, we're good friends. I mean, I love this man. This man saved another piece of the chorus of things. This man helped save my life. Uh, but he said, can't you be smart for 30 seconds a day? Put it in your mouth. And I, you know why, Joy? Because I needed that. And I'm, I'm trying to not, I don't feel ashamed of that. I don't feel ashamed about anything in my life today. I'm proud to be me. I like the man I am. I'm trying to be a better one, but I really like myself. Um, I like this life that I've carved out. I really do. I like that I'm kind. 
I like that I'm a soft motherfucker. Oh, Scott, sorry, I curse sometimes. Um, I do. I like that about myself. But Shaboxin, after failing it enough times, I let it work. I let it work, and it was still a long time until I started to kind of really feel like there could be a light. But, mm -hmm. you know, it even on Suboxone, it took me, I don't know, a few months to even start feeling like myself. And then that mm -hmm. was not, uh, the entire, it's not, I'm not here to say, hey, guys, don't worry about junkies. We got Suboxone. We figured it out. I mean, I know. But it's just you're here saying everybody has their path, right? Yeah. And you had to find, it may have taken you a hundred times. It may have taken you trying different things. But the point that's so important is that you found it. That you found it. Yeah, and, and I'm alive. Yeah, and now 14, almost 15 years in recovery, you're able to share that. And I saw a comment we just had up there that someone said, just by you sharing this part of your story, that that was instrumental for them. And they even look up to you even more. Because of the uh, same, well, and that's how really hard nice was to it to say to people, "Hey, I am on Suboxone. I'm on medication-assisted treatment. I'm not didn't go completely cold turkey, but this has helped me, and this has worked for me." Yeah, I think you know, I didn't. I wasn't hiding it as much as just I wouldn't really scream it from the rooftops for a lot of years because I didn't want people to be upset with me. Mm. Um, I didn't want to like let people down and then people would say like, Oh, you got clean. And, and I would say, God, they're going to be mad at me about this because I'm hearing people on Joe Rogan say things that like, Oh, it's as bad as street dope. And I just think to myself, I got to say something because just, I mean, come on, it doesn't take a rocket scientist. You look at my life right now and then you fast forward 15 years ago and look at my life. And how could you say Suboxone is the same thing as street dope? Is it perfect? No. I love the program. I love AA. I love NA. If you can go cold turkey, then you go for it. I'm not ashamed that I failed. I mean, maybe I am a, I'm envious of those people. I used a program. I got on a program and did it before this thing took me out because I was, you don't, I don't want to say this in like a crappy way. I had a lot of money for a long time. I had a habit that I don't know that most people have access to, uh, and I put it all in my arm and it left me to where only certain kinds of dope would even keep me not sick. I could eat 60 Vicodin 10s and it would just merely make me kind of not sick. I had such a raging addiction to heroin that mm. I really was headed for the grave. And uh, I, I, I finally was smart for 30 seconds a day and just took it. And once you take it, it's out of your hands. And that's what I needed. I was sick to the point I could not have it in my hands. I would, could not be trusted to make the right decisions. And then you pop your Suboxone and you are blocked. It's, blocked. it's out of your hands. And believe me, I tried to shoot up on Suboxone and I learned, I tried it once because I learned my lesson. I got thrust right into sickness and it was awful. And I learned that lesson. And then, so now I know when I take my Suboxone, okay, it's out of my hands. And then the building blocks of putting your life back together I don't know. One day you like a TV show again and you say, holy mm. shit, I haven't liked a TV. I haven't been excited to watch something in years. Mm. And I do owe Suboxone a lot. I owe Suboxone so much. But that shouldn't feel like a thing that takes courage to say. I'm aware of the stigma. I'm aware of the finger pointing from the groups from at NA and AA. I'm, I get it. I'm here to say, isn't the goal to keep people alive? I think so. And that's why I'm telling my story. Suboxone helped me. It, 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 if it's not for you, then it's not for you. But it is a pathway to staying alive and to putting your life back together. I'm living proof. I'm on Suboxone to this day. I mm. might be on it for the rest of my life. I mean, I'm on a tiny dose, but I don't, I, I don't, I can't imagine a world that I would do drugs again. That's hard for me to imagine after all this time. But I mean, I'm still on this small maintenance dose and I'm fine with it. In fact, when it came time that I said, I think I'm ready to get off this, trust me, I've scared the people that I love enough. They said, why? I think it's going pretty good. If it's not broke, why fix it? Because they're mm -hmm. terrified because I put them through hell. Mm -hmm. And I say, you know what? You're right. Everything's going really good in my life. Mm -hmm. I'm certainly not walking around high all the time. I, I forget to take my Suboxone all the time. I mean, and I just wait. Until like the next you day had. 
I mean, but Josh, when I hear you, just the life you've had, you've rebooted your career. I hear you're about to go on tour again, right? Oh, so yeah. You, we, yeah. You, you rebooted your career, you know, you're back doing what you love. You're an inspiration to so many. And so I want to get a few final golden nuggets from you. Just what do you feel through all of this has been the best advice that you've give, gotten on this journey? What's the best advice that you've received? Oh, God. Joy, come on, man. I threw a curveball at you. There, but I'm maybe it's not. I mean, I know there's a lot of golden nuggets that you've heard on the journey. But if there was one thing, one or two things that stick out in your mind. There's too many things. I mean, I just honestly, there's a flood of things that I can't quite grab. I mean, I've gotten so much powerful, good advice uh, and things. But honestly, I mean, my favorite thing ever said to me was, can't you be smart for 30 seconds? Because it honestly angered me enough to, you know, I'll show him. And then, and then he got what he wanted. He wanted me. Uh to get better. That's what Dr. Ramaswamy mm -hmm. water, but that's not really advice. That's too hard of a question. But it's almost like you got to be willing. What I hear you saying to some extent, it's like you bet on yourself. You took a risk. You said, I'll take it. I'll do this. So I think just willing to never give up and keep trying to has to be some advice that people can see from your story. Cause a lot of families who are watching this or people who are struggling saying I'm a lost cause. I'm a lost oh, God, cause. of course. Yes. Yeah. I, I walked around every day feeling like a complete lost cause. I mean, you know, addicts are in this weird spot where I, I just, I wanted to die. I think I didn't care mm. about living. I know it's really dark. It's sad. Um, I didn't expect to be here. So any, there was no planning for the future. And I just feel so blessed to be here. God, you asked such a great question, Joy, about the best advice. I'll give you 30 nuggets later. I can't think of one right now, but it's because I'm on the spot and I don't, I've gotten so many things that they just, they become like mantras to me. And then of course on the show right now, I'm like, think nothing's there. I keep going up to grab one and nothing's there, but people have been so like forthcoming and kind to me. And I just, there's a laundry list of things that I utilize in my life. And I'm, I really apologize. I got nothing for you right now, but I'm That's okay. Too, That's okay. You've much. given us so many different things. I think your oh, story gosh. of perseverance, I think the hope to keep going, I think finding the path that works for you. I mean, there are so many things in, that you said that I think will impact people, not this thing, but that I know will impact people on their journey. So I certainly hope so. It's definitely, I'm telling you, I'm telling you that this is going to really impact somebody. And when I think about, you know, as I ask you a final two questions, I, my question I wanted to ask you is, what would you say to somebody who was where you were 15 years ago? Well, I was just, I, I was just going to say that you had referenced about feeling just the utter darkness, no hope. That is where I was 15 years ago. And it, well, it might feel a little bit cliched. It's just, it gets better. You have to push forward. Oh my God, I just can't. People would, I can, I, I, right now, I just time traveled to myself 15 years ago, 17 mm. years ago, 18 years ago, when people would say those things and I wouldn't let it absorb, but hear me, it gets better. Just walk, walk into the darkness, walk out of the darkness actually, but go take a chance. And if you, if you've tried to get clean and you can't seem to get clean uh, the, the old fashioned way, don't let a stigma or people pointing fingers keep you from staying alive and staying on this planet. And you can try Suboxone. It's Suboxone. It's just, it's one option. It's worked for me. My life is wholesale, completely different than it was, but I didn't, I didn't take Suboxone and just wake up here. It was a long journey, but a beautiful journey. Things start going your way once you put down drugs, but God, I, I, I am, I'm two people at once right now. I can hear this. I hear my own words as myself as the junkie. And I know how hollow these words can feel. People would say things like this and I'd see it, but they weren't talking to me because I had no value in my mind and in my heart. I had no value. My soul was worthless to me. And it took a long time to feel worthy again. It took a long time to have a sense of like value uh, for myself. And I was trapped in that darkness but it does get better mm. 
trust the people, trust the people around you that love you and walk off into the unknown. Cause I promise I'm living proof. The unknown is awesome. Look at the unknown. We got Jason Voorhees hanging out. We got some good, <laughs> good things are happening in the unknown. But- so speaking of good things, what's next for you? Cause I know your fans are of your group of the band are listening and they're like, I know you guys are going on tour soon. But what's next for you? What can people expect? From you? Well, obviously the tour coming up. Uh, it's the second leg of the No World for Tomorrow tour, um, which is, you know, we're deeply excited about it. It's going to be awesome. Uh, we have the Coheed Cruise coming up in October, which Ooh. I feel silly. Oh, it's so fun. <laughs> this is our second one. Um, yeah, so that's what's going on for the band. For us, you know, me and Rob are going to keep pushing forward with Drum Set Confessional, which, again, not to overly plug. I hate doing plugs, but drumsetconfessional.com, Drum Set Confessional on YouTube. And again, addicts, people with addicts in their lives, people whose lives have been touched by drugs or addiction in any way, shape or form can come and share stories. I view the story sharing component of the website as probably the most powerful thing and the thing that speaks to me the most. We are a community. We need to be talking to each other. And if you need help, please don't be shy about reaching out. Uh, Reach out to us. Reach out to me. I mean, we want to talk to you. We are each other's people. I'm your people. You're my people. And that's what we're doing at drumsetconfessional.com. And uh, you can check us out on all the socials, obviously, just to get a sense of what we're doing in the future here. We're doing a lot. There's merch Gosh, galore. It sounds yeah. like a lot. You got a cruise. You got a tour. You got yeah. a drum set confessional. And that just shows the power of recovery. And I see you smiling, you know, like you yeah. are now living the dream. You're doing what you love. And you're doing it from a place of clarity and transparency and you're just doing it. So thank you, Josh. Well, well thank you, Joy. You are lovely. You're I really sharing appreciate your story it. with us tonight. I really appreciate it. You got it. And for all of you who've been watching, whether you're watching live or on the replay, thank you for tuning in to another episode of Addiction Talk. Good night. Mm-hmm.